So either you or someone you know or love is a felon, or maybe you're just thinking about becoming a felon at some point. And I get this question all the time. And rather than answering it every single time, I wanna make a video on it so I can just link people to it. Can my spouse or roommate own a gun if I'm a felon? That's what we're talking about in this video. Let's get into it. So we've got a situation where there are multiple people living in the same dwelling or domicile, a home, apartment, condo, trailer, whatever the case may be. And at least one of these individuals is a felon. And we know that that person cannot possess the firearm because we know that at least in current law, that's a no-go, that's a felony. But what about their roommates? Whether that's a boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, whether that's a spouse or just something more casual and platonic. Where does that leave those people? Do they lose their second amendment rights? Well, in a nutshell, the answer is no, they do not. They can absolutely purchase, possess, and keep firearms. However, subject to checking your local listing, it may be a felony for both that person who's not a felon, as well as the felon to come into contact and come into legal possession of that firearm. There's actually a lot that I just put into that coded sentence, and I really want to spend a couple minutes breaking it apart before I give you an example or two, because it's going to be super important to understand what I mean by possession and ownership. First off, I have never seen a law that prohibits felons from owning firearms. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure it's out there. If you know of one, throw it in the comment box below. But really what all the laws are that are out there that I have seen deal with possession, the P word, possession. So we need to take a moment to define what that is because there's really two different types of possession. We have possession in the sense of, I am holding this pen, I am possessing this pen. It is physically in my grasp and in my control. And then we have possession in the sense of, I am not touching this pen, but it is inside my sphere of reach. It is inside my dominion to use some words that the law likes to use, because why use a five cent word when you can use a $5 word and make ourselves feel good about making a decision like going to law school, right? Even if I just came into the room right now and sat down and I'd never seen this pen before, when I sit down right here, this isn't my pen, never seen it before, I see it and I have access to it, which now means that I'm in what's called constructive possession. You could basically think of that as I am in lawful or legal possession of this pen. So that's gonna be very, very important. Now you notice I said it has two components to it. We have to have knowledge of it and we have to have access to it. So even if I slid this pen across the table, as long as I could say, stand up and reach over to it, even though I can't immediately access it right now, it's still gonna be generally considered to be within my realm of access. Why do we have these laws? Well, super quickly, it basically comes from drugs because in my experience as a former state prosecutor or criminal defense attorney, it just so happens that whenever cops stop a car, there's drugs inside, those drugs rarely seem to belong to someone. They just kind of appeared into the car. Obviously, I'm being a little tongue in cheek here when I say that, but I think you get my point, which is the fact that the laws about possession are often really concerned about showing knowledge and showing access. And the reason is because drugs, nobody owns up to them, at least not all the time. And as a result, the law needs something in order to take the people in the car, whether it's the driver, the passengers, whatever, and connect them to those narcotics. The same definitions oftentimes for possession then transfer migrate all across the criminal code. Code. Again, subject to your local listing, so be sure to check those. But that's the reason why even if you're not in physical possession right now of the pen, you may be in lawful possession. Why is that important? Because, well, obviously now you can imagine that if I'm a roommate, and I've got Derek behind the camera, I'm gonna pick on him. If Derek, he, he's smiling, so that means it's okay. That uh, uh, if Derek's a felon, and if he and I are roommates, uh, and if I take my firearm and he's sitting on their side of the table, I put it down right, right here, he's gonna arguably be in possession of that firearm. Why? Because he sees it and he has access to it, which means he may not be in physical, but he is gonna be in constructive possession. So what does he have to do in that moment? Well, to be perfectly legal, the answer is I should not put the firearm down in the first place because am I now arguably acting as a party to a crime or some sort of conspiracy? to make sure that that firearm now comes into the lawful possession. And again, lawful not in a, it's legal to possess, but lawful in a constructive possession sense. Right, 
you can see some problems. The safest thing is uh, I should not take that firearm out and put it on the table. The safest thing is my firearm should be one of two different locations. It should either be number one in a safe or a locked secure location that my felon roommate has absolutely no access to the inside of, or two, strictly speaking, on my person. And again, I'm not taking it out, putting it in all that kind of stuff. That means if I have to clean it, if I have to disassemble or something like that, again, the safest thing you could do is to either do it at a time when Derek or your resident felon is not inside the premises at that time. They're at work, they're at the grocery store, they're doing whatever it is that felons do, or you're doing it with door closed, ideally locked. Is this overprotective. In other words, am I taking this a little bit to an extreme? A little bit too extreme? Yes. But you have to understand that law deals with some white, some black, and a lot of gray. I'm trying to give you the white hat solution, which is to say I'm trying to give you the, I don't see really a way that a really aggressive prosecutor can even come after you. Everything shy of that, and we're now starting to break things up into a minimum gray, possibly black, again, such as if Derek was sitting on the other side of this table and I start uh, pulling out my firearm to clean, he has access, he has knowledge, he can stand up and reach it. That is going to be at a minimum in a gray area at a maximum in a black area where he and I become roommates in an entirely different setting where we call the government our landlords, which is not a setting that I think either Derek or I would generally prefer, and probably you neither down the lens. But again, none of this actually stops me, the roommate, from actually owning and possessing firearms on site. We just have to be extraordinarily cautious to make sure that Derek or the felon or across on their side of the table. And really this applies to any prohibited possessor, obviously, whether they have a domestic abuse injunction against them, whether they have, uh, I guess, if you live in a red flag law state, whether or not they have been convicted of misdemeanor crime or domestic violence, just that whole list that you fill out when you go to purchase a firearm on your 4473, all of that, it doesn't matter if it's a felon or not. These are the rules for prohibited possessors. You have to understand constructive possession. Now, of course, the last thing I really wanna to touch on here is whether or not you're actually gonna going to be getting prosecuted, arrested, all that kind of stuff. And the answer is, well, look, number one, you have to always follow the law. All right. And I can lose my law license if I tell you to do anything to the contrary. But number two is the fact that if people don't see what's happening, then how are they going to investigate and do all that kind of stuff? Now, to be clear, I'm not in any way, shape or form advising you to break the law. What I am saying is that where's the evidence going to be coming from? All right, now you have to be careful. Now I'm talking to you Derek's down the lens. I'm talking to you felons, you prohibited possessors. He's still smiling and nodding, by the way. So I'm gonna keep this up now. I'm talking to you Derek's right now, all right? Um, and uh, obviously as a criminal defense attorney, I talk to Derek's all the time, many of whom have made some pretty poor life decisions, typically as teenagers or young adults where they got mixed up in some stuff. And they move on to become, frankly, totally upright, productive members of society and the sort of people you would not be creeped out by if they were behind you in line at a grocery store. So I'm not trying to be overly insulting, if you will, of the Derricks out there, um, at least not of all of them. Okay, so listen up all you Derricks out there. You have to remember that if you're with that girlfriend, you're with that boyfriend, you're with that roommate, whatever, pictures, Snapchats, if you have some sort of breakup, that's something that that individual now can hold over you for extortion and blackmail that I have seen and taken the phone calls before here at the defense firm. So you have to be extraordinarily cautious. You have to protect yourselves, Derek, all right? Don't fall for whatever the situation that you're in and no, I mean, no way, shape or form trying to say that people are trying to intentionally set you up, though I'm sure some of them might at some point, but you have to be cognizant of the fact that at the end of the day, you're the one with the legal disability here, and it's you who can easily wind up going to jail or prison because of this subject to the temperament of local law enforcement. So make sure to make the right call. Don't pose for any pictures. Don't put yourself in a situation where uh, you're going to be in violation of any uh, supervision terms or anything like that. There you go. Until the law changes, this is some advice for both the roommates as well as for the felons themselves. If you may be asking yourself as well, another common question I get is if I'm a felon, can I use my roommates? Can I use my girlfriends, my wife's, my husband's, my boyfriend's firearm? That's me a subject for another video. So be sure to tune in because we've got that one coming up next. As always, please take a moment if you've not already done so, click like, share the video around. Of course, please click subscribe so you don't miss the next video in this series and other series as well. Thank you very much, and we will see you in the next one. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content, and we'll see you in the next one.